I want to welcome you here this morning on this beautiful fall morning to Cliftondale Congregational Church. If you are visiting with us, if you would take the card from the front pew, uh, the front of your pew, uh, and fill that out, that will uh, give us a record of your visit. And we also have a gift for you at the back, so uh, come see us after that. But we want to take time to just quiet ourselves and to center ourselves and to give the Lord our undivided attention for this time. So please join me in inviting ourselves into his presence. Father, as we come before you, we thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you for the changing of seasons. We thank you for the changing of leaves. God, life is a moving target. And God, your mercies are new every morning. Where we were yesterday does not need to be where we are today. Today is full of possibilities and under your control. And we ask God now that you will help us to have peace. We ask you, God, that we will hear a word from you. God, know our thoughts. Search us and know us. If there's anything that stands as a wedge between you and us, help us to take care of that and be lifted from that. But we do thank you for each and every person who is here and that, God, that you know us and you see us and you know our names and you know us better than we know ourselves. And God, we worship you, for you are awesome, and you are mighty. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Please uh, join me in praying as Jesus taught us in the Gospels. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as is in the beginning, tis now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Cliftondale. Good morning. Well, thank you so much to Mary Sue for being here and helping us with our, our time of worship for a little while. Please turn in your hymnals to hymn number three, Holy, Holy, Holy. Right under the title, you'll see that this comes from Revelation 4, verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come. Raise your voices together as we praise the great I Am. Holy, holy, holy.
let's continue our worship with the words that are found in your bulletin for Hosanna, praise is rising. seated. The one who helped him, said the man. 
then you can be a neighbor to anyone who needs your help, said Jesus. And you know, it was amazing too, because when I read this again, right after, it doesn't show in this children's Bible, but right after Jesus tells that to the man, that you, anybody can be our neighbor, he says, if you do this and follow me and follow all my commands, of course the Bible shows us how to live anyway, right? But he says, if you do this, you will live. Well, you know, getting back to my neighbor, as I said, he's moving away. So Bill and I went over one day this week, and we brought him a little gift, like a going away present. So he, he enjoyed that. He thanked us for that. And I thought, you know, what if, well, I have a question for you, because I wasn't going to do this. But what if I had gone over and given him a present, I kind of just gave him one of my used things and said, here, you can have it. I don't even know what works. Let's take him along with you and see if you like it. Do you think he thanked us for that? Do you think he liked that? So I have a question for you. I know these are for younger kids, really, but if I said, hey, I brought something for you today. Here, you can keep it. Do you want that? What is it? Check. But what's this whole thing? Check. But what's this part? What's this whole thing like? What are you doing? It's a puzzle. But is it really that good? Why? It's missing pieces. And I brought a baby in front and said, hey, look what I brought you. You think they'd like that? No. No, that's not, not really fine. It's not really helpful. Well, you know, probably we, we don't, shouldn't really just think about what we want. But it's always nice. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Not to do that, but to treat others the way you want to be treated. If I wanted to get a nice gift, maybe then I should give somebody else something what? Nice. nice. Not like broken or not useful, mm -hmm. right? Not going to be kind. So instead of thinking of just myself all the time and saying what I want, if we could change this word and think about others, no. O is for others, what does that become? No. If we think about others, really, all we can do is love. Because if we're thinking about others, that's just what Jesus wants us to do. And that's just the example that Jesus wants us to show, to be loving others always. It's a little bit easier when we're thinking about others than just thinking about ourselves. That's called selfish. That would be selfish if we're just thinking about ourselves. You're right. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that shows us how to live each and every day. Lord God, help us to live your way, to live out our lives showing your love to others, treating everybody we need the way we want to be treated. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we lift up those in our neighborhoods, in our town, and in the church. Begin with those who follow you and help them influence others for good. Let us be salt and light, pointing others to you. Deepen our love for you and for those people around us. Guard us from hypocrisy and from giving into temptation that could harm the cause of Christ. Make us bold in our faith. May our love for you help us to love and forgive others. We pray for the teachers and students and all those in leadership and authority. Raise up leaders who will serve you faithfully at all cost. Give them your mind and surround them with godly counselors who will exercise integrity and work for justice, morality, mercy, and freedom. Give us grateful hearts, O Lord. Help us to see and acknowledge your hand in all things. From each breath we take to the simplest pleasures of life to those events which change us forever. We know all things are in your hands. We pray for the lost, the hurting, the lonely and the sick, the bereaved and those who are imprisoned behind both visible and invisible walls. Send your comfort, your peace, your calming presence to those who are without hope. Protect the defenseless and hold them close to your heart. We pray for the laborers who bring the good news of Jesus to people around the world. Hear the cries of the persecuted believers, too. Make them brave and give them your powerful protection. 
There are so many needs in the world, Lord, but you are sufficient for every need. Your name is powerful and your power is great. It's in your name that we pray and believe. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear to us and grant us thy peace. Amen. I want to take this time to go before God on our own individual behalves uh, and to seek out anything that may be a barrier between us and Him, maybe some unreconciled anger, maybe some sin of some sort. But it's always good that we do that so that way we have a clear channel with God. So please let us spend some time in silent confession to the Lord and then we'll confess together as a community. But please join me in silent confession. Please join me in praying our corporate confession as printed in your bulletin. Father, we come to you with repentant hearts. Forgive our pride and disobedience. Lord, help us to serve you with open and willing hearts for the honor and glory of your name and for the salvation of your people. Amen. Our ushers may come forward to take our offering. Please stand.
please pray with me? Father, as we come to the portion of our service to give back what you've given to us, God, we do thank you for the opportunity to give back. We thank you for the blessing that you have given us and to now share that as you uh, take it and multiply it and use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. God, we do also ask you to spur us on to use our talent and our time also for your service. We do ask that you bless both the gift and the giver. And we ask this in your son's name. Hymn number 139, Great is Thy Faithfulness, Hymn 139. as we continue our service. Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is from Acts 7, verses 30 to 35, that can be found on page 1,702 in your pew Bibles. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to look more closely, he heard the Lord's voice. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses whom they had rejected with the words, 
who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This ends the reading. Let us pray. Father, as we come before you, we just thank you for your word and just for the stories within it. God, uh, between the story that was just read and the story we're going to read was several thousand years, but it still has meaning then and still has meaning today. We ask, Lord, that nothing more, nothing less than what you'd have me to say be what comes forth for your glory alone. Amen. You can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. That's going to be on page 90. Exodus chapter 3 will be on page 90. One of my favorite movies of all time is the movie Gladiator. I love that movie. It makes me, when I watch it, it makes me want to go out and do something, you know? <laughs> it, it really gets the blood pumping. But, um, and it's quotable. I can quote just about the whole thing, um, which is to the chagrin of anybody who's watching it with me because I will quote it with inflection. Um, but there's a great quote that comes at the very beginning of the movie. And there's this, this great battle scene. And before these troops, these Roman troops are going to go into battle, uh, Russell Crowe's character, Maximus, says, what we do in life echoes in eternity. Now, I'm not the first pastor to take this movie and love this movie and take this quote because it really fits our lives. What we do in life echoes in eternity. And the story we're going to read is really about that. It's really about this idea. But you see, what we do in life does indeed echo in eternity because we are eternal creatures. Each and every one of us is created for eternity. We have an eternal soul. And God has given us a call in our lives to be of eternal significance. Anything that we do for God is not just a good deed. It's not just to make us feel good. It affects eternity. To do something for our fellow man is not just to make them feel better, not just to improve their situation. As Christians, it's ultimately to help them to have a great eternity and to recognize what Christ has done for them. Sometimes our purpose and our calling changes over the course of our lives. Sometimes we will maybe have it elude us for several years and then it will come later and then we'll find out what our true life's calling is. What one author called where our greatest joy and the world's greatest need meet. We're going to be continuing in our sermon series on Moses. And last week, just to recap, we established that, you know, God had seen the suffering of his people in Egypt. That they were under a tyrannical king, and this king had oppressed them because he was afraid of them. And for hundreds of years, they were in slavery. And God now was going to start bringing about, in his timing, not just their freedom, but to also make an example of Egypt. And um, we also saw that this Hebrew heritage, this Israelite heritage, Jewish heritage, that Moses had was not something that eluded him, even though he was raised as an Egyptian. Uh, he knew about it and saw someone beating up one of his fellow Hebrews and ended up committing murder. Um, and lived most of his life in exile. And that's where we find him now. We find him in exile, living as a shepherd. And as we just read in, in the story that we read in Acts, this is coming from the testimony of Stephen. And you might remember Stephen was one of the first Christians killed for the faith. He was stoned to death. Uh, and before he is killed, he's just given a testimony of, of everything that God has done. And, and he talks about Moses, how it's all connected. And so he says a very interesting detail that we just read was that Moses had, was 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian and ran away. 
And between chapter 2 and chapter 3, there's another 40 years. So Moses is 80 at this point. And uh, that's where we find our story. So, and as before, uh, I'll say again, this is a little bit of a different format than our usual sermons. Uh, if you're like me, you, you open up the Bible, you read the passage, but then you kind of wait for the pastor to tell you, okay, now what, how does that apply? Uh, the Old Testament is, is really a tapestry of stories. So we're going to be reading a large chunk of scripture, a large chunk of story, and I'm not going to go anywhere near um, getting all the truth out of it. We're just going to focus on one, just a few things. But I'm hoping that God will maybe speak to you throughout the week as we read. So allow yourself to be immersed in the story. Allow yourself to be in the story. Allow yourself to think about, what if I was Moses? What if I was there? How would I feel as this stuff happened to me? So without further ado, let us go now to uh, Exodus 3, starting in verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. That right there is a sermon in and of itself. When God calls, here we are. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So, again, we got to remember, Moses has been living and has grown accustomed to this new life. He has a wife. He has a father-in-law. He is a shepherd now. He's also a fugitive. And he's been doing this for 40 years. His whole, uh, you know, the spans of a typical career already, he's been doing this um, shepherding. And no doubt he's accustomed to the rhythms and, the, and the, the, the work of shepherding. But God had something else in mind for him. And it's clear in the scriptures that at this time people were living a quite a bit longer than they do today. But even so, 80 years old was the age that was closer to retirement than being commissioned for the greatest job of one's life. Or starting to fulfill one's calling, true calling. But this is what happens to Moses. You see, time doesn't matter to God because God is eternal. It was an ordinary day for Moses, but by the end of it, he had encountered God in a very visible and powerful way and was given a mission. Now, this is not something that Moses ever wanted. This is not something that Moses even asked for. Sure, he hated the oppression of the, of the Hebrews. He had killed a man over it, but what could he do? For his, as it worked out in his mind, he could probably be killed if he stepped foot in Egypt again. But God saw in him something that he didn't see in himself. And it was going to do something through him that he could not have done himself. You see, we see two things that I think are vital truths in this first part of the story. One, God is with us even in the wilderness season of our lives. This theme of God calling and talking to people in the wilderness runs throughout the Old and New Testament. And we ourselves go through wilderness times where God may feel far off, we may feel alone, we may feel like we're isolated. But a lot of times that's where God can be the loudest. That's where God can speak the fullest to us. Because all the other distractions are now away and now we're dependent on something beyond ourselves. We're at the end of our own rope. 
But the other truth is that God has a call on all of us and work for us to do as long as we have breath in this life. There is always something of eternal significance that we can do until he calls us home. And unlike the world, God doesn't see what, what the world sees. It doesn't see, you know, oh, they're not gifted enough, they're not intelligent enough, they're too young, they're too old, they're all these things that are qualifiers for the world. God doesn't see it. All God sees is someone who says, here I am. And that's what Moses did. Moses, when God called, said, here I am. The world may look at our age or our past or our reputation or our medical history or any number of things that could qualify us or unqualify us. But God doesn't care about any of that. God cares about willingness. And if you say yes to God, you can rest assured that whatever you need from God to complete that task, to fulfill that calling, you will get it. Because he's not just someone who says, all right, this is your job. When it's done, come back and report to me. He's going to go with you. You know, we'll see as he goes to the Egyptians, as he confronts Pharaoh, he's not going alone. He is going with God. God is already there. God is acting through him. The star of the show is really God. He's just the vessel. So that hopefully is an encouragement to us because there are so many things in our lives that take us down, that tell us that we're not worth much. But God makes us valuable. And he calls us and we have something to make this world a better place. We're on this earth to contribute to his great cause, the cause of Christ, the cause of redeeming the world, of taking the gospel, of helping people to realize that they don't have to be lost in their sin, but they can be given new life through Christ. It's just something they can accept. They don't have to earn it. So then we go on to the next part. So Moses hears what God has planned, and he does what you and I would probably do. He starts to ask some questions. And often when we ask kinds of questions like this, they're based on the focus of our, of our limits and not on God's greatness. So we'll pick up the story in, in verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? This is a really humble thing to say. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your father has sent me to you. And they asked me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this, again, is another sermon in and of itself. Just the name of God. This is God's personal name. And this is Yahweh. But it's a name that's so holy that observant Jews will not say it. And I, I hesitate to say it. Uh, you'll usually hear me say Adonai, which is master. But Yahweh is God's personal name. And it means I am who I am. But it also contains the other two tenses within it. I was who I was. And I will be who I will be. In other words, I do not change. I am utterly sufficient in myself. And the fact that I am is really all that is needed to be known. And he says, he continues, This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. But this doesn't satisfy Moses. Continuing on, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, God said. 
So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. So God gives him two assurances to his questions. First, I will be with you. Two, here are some signs that will validate, or validate uh, that I spoke with you. He gives them two miracles to do. But Moses continues. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since. You have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and, and tongue. One of the translations is, I'm slow of speech and fat of tongue. That's a, that's a good uh, way of saying, you know, if you don't want to talk, you can say, well, I'm slow of speech and fat of tongue. Um, the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you to speak and will teach you what to say. But all this humility, I think, has now turned into what we will see next. And Moses finally just spits it out. He says, pardon your serving Lord, just please send somebody else. I don't want to do it. I'm scared to do it. I don't, I don't, I, I never asked for this. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. He said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. So Moses was given an impossible job. He was a fugitive. He was an exile. He had ran away from Egypt as fast as he could. But now we see a very human Moses. And some folks may be tempted to condemn Moses on his lack of faith. But I don't think any of us would really react any differently. He didn't want to be a leader. He didn't want to be someone who, who had greatness and glory which is probably one of the reasons why God asked him. One of the very reasons God asked him was this humility. But Moses was shaking in his boots at the prospect of going back and confronting Pharaoh, who at this point was the son of the man who wanted to kill him uh, when he left Egypt. Notice the first question. He says, who are you? God had actually answered this question in the bush. And um, it's kind of like if you've ever been in that situation where you're in a tense situation and you're shocked and someone starts talking to you and they're halfway through the conversation, you realize you don't know what their name is. This is kind of what happened to Moses. Moses sees the burning bush. He goes, well, that's weird. And then he also hears the voice of God and he goes, oh, here I am. And God says, I am the God of your father and Abraham. And, and all this happens, and halfway through the conversation, Moses says, oh, well, actually, who are you? <laughs> so it's kind of funny um, and very human. Moses was just like you and me. But over the course of this last conversation, we see Moses continue to question God until he gets to the real reason for all the questions. He just doesn't want to go. He's scared. It's inconvenient. You see, God's calling is not always convenient. It's not always comfortable, and it is always, always bigger than us. It is always too big for us to do on our own. And in this case, Moses was being asked to do something he didn't even remotely dream about. God understandably gets frustrated at this. Not because of Moses' question, but because of, at the very end, his refusal his lack of faith that God would, would go with him because he, he said he would. It's almost like when you are talking to somebody and you're, you know, you're asking questions, but it's only at the end that you get to what the conversation's really about. Moses wanted a way out. And even at the very end, God gives him a concession. He gives him the concession of his brother who was more eloquent. To say, I'll go. So he's, he's really not going alone. Not only does he have God, but he also has his brother who will go with him. So there are two things we can get with this. God has a call for each of us. And it may even be more than one. It may change from the season of life to season of life. You may be called to this, and then you may be called to that. Um, but regardless of what it is, he called you that because he believed in you enough to do it. He believed in you enough. He knew the potential. He doesn't make mistakes. 
We may feel unqualified, and, and we may very well be. Moses was not qualified to be a leader. But that was one of the reasons why God picked him. Because God is qualified for anything, and God can use anybody. He often uses the least likely person. Even we look at Jesus. Jesus, nothing was special about Jesus. He was a peasant. He was a nomad. He was just another Jewish man living in, 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 in Palestine. Nothing special about him. Another religious teacher. But he was God in the flesh. So God uses... It does, doesn't, does, he doesn't worry about what the world looks for. He goes with what he can use. And he knew he could use Moses. He knew Moses had what it takes. Second thing, when God calls us, he will equip us. We'll never have to go it alone. We won't have to go without any gifting. God will empower us completely. You see, Moses was not a military guy. He wasn't rich. He had no influence. He was a shepherd living out in, 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 in the backwoods with his family. Not the first round draft pick for the job by any stretch of the imagination. But God gave him the skills. God gave him miracles to perform. God said that he would go with him. He gave him his brother to be his, his, his mouth. God will equip us for whatever the job is. And it is too big for us. Even as a pastor, I can't do this job in my own power. It's God who qualifies me. It's God who call, called me. I'm just like anybody else. It's through God that I have any power to do anything. And any ideas or anything that comes through my head, this sermon, any of it, I can't take credit for it. It's God. All I did was say yes. God does the rest. And that's what will happen with us. And any growing Christian will experience both a call on their life in the big sense and a call on their life in the small sense. Your job, your family, your career, that could be your calling. But also, maybe there's a neighbor that you need to reach out to. Maybe where you're at, there is someone that you can help. Maybe where you live, you're strategically placed there because God wanted to reach your neighbor or wanted to reach your coworkers. Nothing's an accident. God is, in, is sovereign and is in control, and where we are is, is where we are. And even in the mistakes, of course God doesn't lead us into temptations and sins and mistakes, but even in our mistakes, after repentance, He can work it out for His advantage. We're never too far gone. There's always hope. There's always a second chance. There's always just getting back on the road. We'll see this with Moses. Moses made mistakes. He made big mistakes. Even though he was empowered by God, he made huge mistakes. But God still turned it around and used it. Use the worst in him to bring out the, the, the fullest, uh, fullness of himself, of God. He can do the same thing with, with our, our mountains and our valleys and everything. Both are just as sacred and important. It's a brave thing to say yes to God in whatever sense, big or small. And it will assure you that you will have a life that means something and that makes a difference. And as Christians, there's no more vital call than the call on all of us to share the gospel with our neighbors and our friends. To go forward and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what all of us have been given, the Great Commission. All of us are missionaries, regardless of what our job is. If we are Christians, that is our job. And God will use you and God will empower you. All you have to do is say yes. So what is God calling you to? Now, I believe everything in here is history. I believe there was a burning bush. I believe these miracles happened. I've seen things in my own personal life, spiritual things, that I, I believe in these miracles. I believe in miracles because God is powerful. But maybe you haven't seen a burning bush. I never have. But that doesn't mean that God's not speaking. And maybe you might be at a place in your life where you go, I have nothing to give. You do. 
Don't let, the, don't let Satan lie to you. If you have breath in this life, this is something that I, I tell young people. This is something I tell old people. This is something I tell everybody. As long as you've got the breath of life in you, you have a calling and you have a purpose. And God will use you to make a difference in this world and you will make a mark on eternity. That is your destiny. Moses was just an 80-year-old shepherd who was then able to stand up to the most powerful man in Egypt, not on his own power, but in God's. God will do the same through any of us, no matter how young, how old, our health or our skill. God can use us for his great purpose. But when he calls, we have to say, here I am, Lord. Will you dare to embrace that call? Will you dare to be open to it when God says your name? And will you dare to say, here I am? I hope that we all do. And I hope that we do it every day. Let us pray. Father, as we come before you, we thank you that you are a great God. First of all, we thank you that you gave your son for us. That you, God, again, you being one God, but three in person, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you came down. We, it's a mystery of how you became flesh. But we thank you that you took our debt, our sin, our mistakes, our foibles, every place that we fell, all the regrets, all the, all the mess-ups, you paid for them. And now all we have to do is accept your forgiveness and walk in it. God, there are a lot of people that, don't, that, that, that need that message, that don't have that hope that are lost. We ask God that you help us to be your hand and your feet. Give us the call to go where you will send us. And God, when, we, when you call, don't let us think about the details. Let us just be brave enough to say yes. You will work out the details. We thank you, Lord, that you choose to use us. Who are we? Who are we that you would even care? In the grand scheme of the universe, why do we even matter? But we do. We matter enough that you died for us, that you desire a relationship with each and every one of us. All we have to do is accept that. Your love for us is unchanging. God, whatever... We may need to hear from you today. Whatever other things that you want to say to us through this story, we ask, Lord, that you will, throughout this week, do that. But again, we give you glory for your word and for the life of Moses, who in 2019, 3,000, 4,000 years since he lived, he's still making a difference. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. It is in God's power that he sends us out to fulfill our calling. And our hope, our future is in Christ alone. So please stand as we sing in Christ alone. The words can be found in the pages of your bulletin. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, the solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Body lay, light of 
of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's cross has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. With the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can. Please pray with me. Father, as we go out into the world, into our week, whatever we may be facing, whatever stresses or obstacles or anything challenging, God, we ask that you will help us, that you'll be present with us, that you'll draw close to us. We pray, Lord, that we leave here with a fresh filling of your spirit. And God, that we'll be empowered through whatever you, uh, whatever we have to go through this week. We do thank you for all the blessings in our lives. And God, we ask that you help us to be reminded of those. And we, we bow our heads in gratitude to that. But help us to be your hands and feet as we leave this place. For we all have a mission. And when you call, may we say, here I am. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.